If a team doesn't have a meeting, it is no different than Ashley, my wife, and I deciding not to communicate anymore as a husband and wife. Business of Architecture, episode 230. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, you can get free instant access to the four-part architecture from Profit Map video that I've prepared especially for podcast subscribers, by going to the website freearchitectgift.com. If you aren't at a computer, you can also text the phrase Profit Map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377 to get instant access to that. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage Partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects, Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. You can get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy-to-customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard-earned profit. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today, you'll hear from a guest who focuses on liberating architecture firm owners from the chaos of working in their business. If that sounds familiar, you are going to love today's episode with Scott Beebe. Scott Beebe is a business growth and scaling expert who helps architecture firm owners create a firm that runs by itself and can be sold later instead of disappearing when you retire. Billionaire real estate entrepreneur Gary Keller says that you are only a business owner if you can walk away from your business and your net worth increases. I was absolutely captivated by that idea that business owners are people who can truly be on vacation somewhere while the business is running without them successfully. If you can't walk away from your business and your net worth increases, you're just an employee of your business with all the management responsibilities and risk. In this interview, you'll discover how to create a business of which you are an owner, not just an employee. You'll learn how to create a business that has real value beyond you. With a business that practically runs itself, all areas of your life can improve because they're all tied together. Your relationships, your home life, your personal quality of life, stress can evaporate like the morning fog. So without further ado, here is today's show. Hey, Scott Beebe, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Enoch, I'm fired up as always. I love hanging out with you, man. So Scott, start out by telling, telling us exactly what it is that you help architecture firm owners do. 100% every day. We wake up every single day to liberate small business owners, particularly architecture firm owners, be liberated from chaos. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we do. That's why Monday is my favorite day of the week because it's the first open day that we can wake up and liberate small firm owners from chaos. Tell me exactly what does that mean to liberate a business owner from chaos? All right. So there's a couple of things that is involved with that. And we've got a layout. And essentially, Enoch, the very first thing that we've got to start with in order for a small firm owner to literally be liberated from this kind of treadmill mindset where they're constantly on it is they've got to be able to detailed uh, in a detailed format, articulate their vision story. If they can't uh, in a, in a uh, kind of a, a few pages, tell us exactly what the future of their firm looks like. They're going to be constantly getting new, uh, placing new bids, getting new projects, and it's all going to be discon, uh, you know, kind of disconjoined together. It's all going to be fragmented out there. And so instead of taking only projects that take the firm in one particular direction, now they're going to take just a mix of projects here and here and here and here, and it's going to cause confusion not only among their own minds, but their minds of their team and the minds of their customer. Their customer is not going to know what kind of architecture firm are you. And that's what kind of perpetuates all the chaos. Okay. Give me an example of, do you have an example for one of your clients? And I know you don't just work with architecture firm owners, you work with other business owners as well. Uh, Help us understand exactly why vision is so important because it's something that we hear a lot. And I have a feeling that our audience might gloss over when they talk about this vision. Why is that important? How does it, how does it really matter? Can you give me an example of that? Enoch, I think the reason we gloss over it is because we've turned it into cliche. We've turned the idea of vision into cliche rather than seeing it as reality because we've taken quotes. We know the quotes, uh, you know, where there's no vision, people scatter. 
Uh, we've taken the quotes, if you don't know where you're, gonna, where you're going, you'll get there every time. And we say those in cliche form, but we don't internalize them. We don't ingest them and realize, no, they're really true. Where there is no vision, people are confused. They're scattered. They're all over the place. And, and it, re- it, it leads to some really bad consequence. And so for, for firm owners to understand that when I create articulated clarity among my vision, and then I share that, I cast that vision with the team and even with customers, now all of a sudden it's their opportunity to choose whether or not we're and what our process is, is a good fit for them or not. Team members, customers, because here's what I know. In fact, there's, a, there's an architecture firm right across the street from where I'm sitting right now. And they recently got into a situation with a small business owner here locally, which is right across the street that way, for a new uh, business in town that they were designing and they were going to build this building to support the business. And after about three months of that relationship, they finally had to dissolve the relationship because there was a misfit between who they are as a firm and what this customer expected. Whereas if they would have sat down at the front and said, hey, here's our vision, here's where we're going, then it offers the customer a great opportunity to go, you know what, I'm in with that. I want that or just the opposite. That's not really a fit for me. Okay, so you gave the example of a firm that pairs up with a client who's not a fit. Give me an example of any business you've worked with, whether it's a firm or a different kind of business owner that might even be interesting. You talked about if they don't have this vision, they're all over the place and there's some chaos happening. Give me an example of what that looks like, a story from one of your past clients where you came in, there was no vision and they were spinning their wheels. Yeah, so we've got a lot of those, just about everybody we have the privilege of being able to work with. These heroic small business owners, they're usually coming into a situation where they're just kind of shotgunning and wrapping and firing wherever the market takes them. They're following that sort of thing. And so we had a, uh, we had a really great um, example of this. Uh, in, in, let's stick with the construction industry a little bit. And what we have found out was a home builder. And this home builder had started to build in a very high-end exclusive neighborhood here in the local area for us. That's going to represent about a 900000 to a $5 million home price point in the area that we're at here. But they were also dabbling in the 500000 to 900000 area and even messing around and peppering with the three to $500,000 area. And so they had homes in these different elements. Well, what they started to realize is that there were a lot of mistakes that were going on at not only the high-end homes, but also the lower-end homes as to what they were building. And we realized through writing the vision down and then creating systems and processes through that, that there was no systematized approach to how we do that. And then once we got the vision written down and what they really wanted to build, which uh, incidentally was that middle section, that's where their, their, their sweet spot really was, that five hundred to $900,000 price point home. They realized that the systems and processes to build that home are different than what it is to build a home that's a million plus, or it's different than, than to build a home that's $400,000 or less. And so once they had clarity on the vision, now their superintendents had clarity, their vendors and suppliers had clarity, their customers had clarity, so they knew exactly what to build them. Does that mean they don't build million dollar plus homes? No, they have a few that they do because people come and specifically ask, but they're very upfront to say, this is our process. This is what you're buying into. So we're going to build you a million two home, but we're going to build it using the same process that we build in building or in use in building a $600,000 home. That has provided them abundant clarity. So now they can go sit down with developers and they can begin to strike deals with developers based on this one niche that they work in. And they can also build out a system and process for that. So they had a complete turnaround all because they articulated their vision and they built systems and processes to support that one element. Okay. And what kind of chaos, you mentioned that earlier, what kind of chaos were they actually having in their business that you were seeing when you came into the situation? So all the accounting was shifting all across the board. The way that they were having to account for these higher end homes versus the lower and the middle end homes was totally different. So their bookkeeping team, their accounting team was in a constant swirl trying, trying to take POs, get those POs here, move some of those POs there. They were having to use different vendors because the higher end home required a different level of uh, material. And so they're having to use different vendors. So their accounting team was totally stretched. Their, their field team, superintendents, their general superintendents were totally stretched as well. And once they become stretched, not in a healthy stretch of growth, but in a stretch where it just feels like they're constantly putting out fires and feeling stretched in 17 different directions, that then created tension among the team, which created tension between the team and the owner. 
and because they didn't have process in place for consistent team meetings that were going to help support the build out, there was a lack of communication, which created frustration. And Enoch, as you well know, when there is no communication, the mind kind of fills in the gaps of what we think is going on. And so both the owner and the team began to, to kind of lie to themselves about what was happening in the business because they wouldn't sit down and have the conversation. Well, they could never find time to sit down and have a conversation because they were constantly putting out fires of things that were going on. And so it was the whirlwind. It was the treadmill. If I don't show up tomorrow, then nothing's going to get done on that project rather than having the stability of systems to run the business. And how is that affecting the business owner's life? So what we have found in the long term is that, you know, people will say, Enoch, we've heard this before that, well, Scott, it's just business. I'm doing this decision based on just business. No, it's not. Everything is connected. Uh, a man or a woman's home life is connected with their business life, is connected with their family life, is they're connected. So you can't have something positive or negative happen at home that you're not going to uh, take into work with you. So what was happening was the stress that was being created because of the chaos that was swirling within the business was now being internalized taken home, frustration was being taken out on the spouse and the kids because of the stress they were feeling at work. Now, when they had stress with the spouse and the kids, the snowball effect took place. They were going back into work with the stress that they had found at home because of the stress from work, and it was feeding that stress at work. So, it was building and building and building. And then you can show manifest of lack of sleep, lack of attention, lack of focus, dropping balls, uh, overspending, overeating. I mean, it can go all, way, way past what we would consider natural chaos for the business. It really is a spiraling out of control. And so many small business owners are feeling that, but they don't know what to do about it. Okay. And so when you come into the situation, you help them identify the vision. You talked about that. And then what is the point that you actually want to get these business owners to? Yeah, ultimately, uh, Enoch, what, what they need to have is not only a vision, a mission, and a strong set of unique core values, not you know, trustworthiness and responsibility. We should all have those. But things that you're really going to dr drive decision-making on, you're going to have those in place. Then you're going to have a series of articulated and very specific systems and processes in place. Delegation process, team meeting process, weekly schedule process, 12-week uh, goal process, you know, all of these things that we talk about a lot uh, with business owners. You're going to have those in place, drafted out, uh, defined, recorded, so that you can begin to train your team. Really, the end game is for us to get a small business owner or a small firm owner to the point where they're the chief training officer of their business. So instead of working in it, they're spending more time working on it, which then frees up marginal time so they can backfill the marginal time with what matters most. Some of that's a vacation, some of that's family time, some of that's more work on the business, but it's a different kind of work on the business, more forecasting, strategy, thoughtfulness down the road of what that looks like. Okay. And so when you're working with architecture firms, in particular design firms, what are some of the primary mistakes that you see them making in their business that is causing them to feel like a slave to that business? So let's, let's call one of the mistakes more of an excuse. And we actually just heard this yesterday. And it was the excuse of, well, Scott, we've got permits, bids, and proposals that, that they have to go out at all different times and random times during the day. So what we start to buy into is the lie that we have to be at the beck and call of everybody at every minute at every time. And it's not true. And instead, what you can do, because here's what we know, Enoch, we know deep down that people are looking for structure. People want stability. So if an architectural firm owner can create stability within the firm, not only for the team, but for the customer, the customer will follow the lead. So let's take this example. If you say, well, I've got to constantly, I have to be the one reviewing the final bids before they go out to make sure that there's no errors. Okay. A, Let me stop you there for a yeah. second. Because you mentioned this did come up yesterday. Of course, we together run the Architecture Firm Freedom Formula coaching program where we walk architecture firms through this process. And it sounded like you were referring to uh, our call, our coaching call that we had yesterday with the clients who are part of that program. And this is a, this is a particular architect who has, uh, I think he has about a firm of 10 to 12. Why don't you, without giving his name, um, could you tell me just about that experience, what was happening? and what you recommended and the resolution that he came to, I feel that that would help out our listeners a lot. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And thanks for that invite. So this was a great situation where you've got a firm, they're in an open office concept, which is a challenge, by the way. I, I, I like the idea, but it is a challenge from a communication standpoint. The reason is, is because any question is fair game at any time, or at least that's the perception <laughs> in an open office. 
And so you got to be very careful with that. So what was happening was the firm owner had decided that he needed to be the one. He, we actually ran him through the exercise of doing a delegation roadmap. It's essentially a brain dump of every task that's in your head that you do as a firm owner out on a sheet of paper. And then we've got a system of ranking that and how delegatable that item is. Does it give you energy? How much time is it uh, taking away? And how much is that time costing you? And so it runs through this whole thing. He had done a fantastic job of building out the tool. And one of the items on the delegation list was final review of bids, proposals, and permits. And we really pushed back on him on that and said, hey, we're not convinced that you need to be the final reviewer. But just for the sake of the discussion, we'll go ahead and say that you are. And then he was saying, well, we can't, we can't systematize that because they happen at, at any given time. And so this is where we pushed back because what was happening is he'd have his team, they knew what to do and how to put a bid together, how to put a proposal together, how to put permitting paperwork together. They knew how to do it, but he wanted to make sure that it was just right before it went out the door. Well, essentially what he was saying that, you know, one of these could come up at two o'clock on a Tuesday. Hey, this needs to go out the door. We need to, we need to get this out the door. And so what we did is we challenged him on that and said, hey, if we give you an hour a day devoted exclusively, not to email, not to scrolling Facebook, not to doing accounting, not to any of that, but exclusively devoted to nothing but paperwork review, bids, proposals, permits, would that be enough to cover what you need to do reviews before these things go out the door? And he goes, well, yeah. I said, all right, from now on, three to four, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is your review day where you're going to take anything that's going to pile up on your desk throughout the day and you're not going to freak out about it. It's just going to pile up right there. And then at three o'clock, you're going to take your cell phone, you're going to put it away, you're going to turn off all notifications, you're going to turn off everything. And that is your review hour. And everybody in your office is going to know this is the hour that he reviews all paperwork that goes out during this day. I said, you watch what happens. The systematic structure that you build is going to give freedom to your team. And and because what what he was thinking, and this is a faulty thought, but what he was thinking is I always want to be available to my team. Well, if you're always available, then you're never available. And so instead, what we want you to do is put you into a little bit of a box and I guarantee you, he's going to find that he's not going to need five hours a week to review all of this paperwork. It's going to take him less time than that. And it's going to free up marginal time for him to be able to reallocate to the things that matter most. But you got to be willing to, you know, Enoch, it's one thing for us to kind of lay it out there. At the end of the day, he's got to be able to pull that through. And that's what we're going to hold him accountable to next week. Okay, so what you're saying, just to summarize here, is that here was an architecture firm owner who felt responsible for any proposal, as he should, that goes out the door. And he wanted to make sure that the verbiage was right, that the language is right. Also, any and any of the contracts, any things like, you know, agreements with contractors and things like that. And so what would happen is a lot of times, he, he shared with us on the call, of course, that they were always under the gun of a deadline. Right. So I know your first suggestion was, hey, well, why don't we go ahead and just take all those things and once a week you set aside time to review those. And he was like, man, we are up against the gun on like an hour. Like this needs to be in this hour. And that's when I get it. And I'm like running it out the door to get that thing where it needs to be on time. And so that's why. And it was leading to a lot of chaos. It was leading to him working a lot of extra hours. And so what you suggested, which you just gave us an excellent explanation of, I just want to summarize, make sure I understand is you said, hey, why don't we just say, agree with the team, let them know what the expectation is that once a day from X o'clock to X o'clock, I will have open office hours, so to speak, for any proposal, for any change order document that needs to go out, and I'm going to review it. And that way, and I'm not holding up the process, but at the same time, people aren't just interrupting him at every second and preventing him from getting what he needs to get done. Done. That's right. That's exactly right. And this is where it comes through. And a lot of firm owners, Enoch, are going to hear this and they're going to go, yeah, but, yeah, but. And what we need to be able to do as, as coaches, as overseers for firm owners say, no more buts. We're, we're not going to have any more, well, this might not work in my, it will work. We just need to come up with a process that will work. There is a system. There's a process. You might go, well, it's not, you know, once a day for uh, five days a week. It has to be longer than that because we've got more paperwork. Fine. Make it two hours. Make it an hour and a half. Do one in the morning, one in the afternoon. We've just got to build a system. And then once the system is built, you got to show up and work the system. So when you say this, yeah, but what are some of the yeah, buts I get? Because I have an, I have a feeling that for some of our audience members, these are very legitimate concerns that they have about their businesses. Walk us through that. 
So a couple of the, 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 the yeah buts, as you've put it, is, yeah, but his firm is not as big as our firm. Yeah, but his firm is bigger than our firm. Yeah, but he's in a different style of architecture than what we're doing. He's doing residential, we're doing commercial. Or he, you know, she's doing commercial and we're doing high-end religious work, you know, whatever it might be. You will always be able to find a nuance. But the beauty of what we get to do, especially with the Business on Purpose platform, is, and this is why Enoch, for you and I to be able to do this together is so powerful because you bring the architectural focus to it. But what I bring to it is the ability to say, hey, this doesn't just work in architecture, by the way, this works everywhere. So every time you give me a yeah, but I get to come back and say, I'm not buying it. I'm just not going to buy it because it's not true because I've seen over and over and over again in industry after industry, the principles work even though the strategies may look a little bit different. And so that's what we've got to be able to focus on as small firms owners is the principle of what's at work. And the principle in this case with the example we just gave you is the principle of focus block of time and systematic process. That principle works. Now we need to take your unique situation and build the strategy around that. Strategy short term, principle is forever. So, Scott, I want to take just a moment here to invite our audience members. We are giving a, an upcoming training uh, where Scott's gonna, Scott and I are going to go more into detail over how to claim back the freedom in your firm. Uh, it's, you get uh, one AI learning unit for attending this free presentation. And to see that and learn more about what Scott's talking about here, you can go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. So that's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. And on that webinar, you'll learn how to be liberated, as Scott said, from the chaos of working in your business and start working on your business. Scott, you, you mentioned the uh, strategy versus principles. Could you tell me what you mean by that? So principles are age old. We talk about vision and sometimes people can roll their eyes a little bit. And I get it. Again, going back to what we talked about earlier is cliche. The idea of vision is not from Peter Drucker, the management guru. It's not from Jen Collins. It's not from Harvard. Uh, it's not from any of that. Vision is age old. Vision has been around since literally the, 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 the foundation of time. The nation state of Israel today exists because of a vision that was cast thousands of years ago. And it's a really powerful story if you think about it. It's just history. I'm not even talking about religion. Just total, total history. And so as you think about this historically, principles are things that have been around and they cross generations, they cross industries, they cross movements, they cross, they cross all of that stuff. But strategies are here today, gone tomorrow. So a strategy 10 years ago was MySpace. That strategy's moot. It's ridiculous. It's over. You would never do that today. Today, the strategy is Snapchat. Uh, whereas tomorrow, the strategy is going to be something completely different. And so principles are age old. They last for a long, long period of time. But strategies are very, very near term, very short term. They're here today. They're gone tomorrow. And so we need to hold strategies with a loose hand, but we need to lock in to principle. Are there any other mistakes that come to mind that you commonly see with these architecture firm owners or business owners in general that keeps them from having the kind of freedom that they aspire to in their lives? So Carol Dweck talks about uh, in her book, Mindset, the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. Uh, the, 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 the first evidence of a growth mindset is when somebody's willing to sit down and write their vision story because it feels a little ethereal. It feels out there, kind of hocus pocus, magic, that sort of thing. But if somebody's willing to do it, it shows me that they've got a growth mindset. They believe that there's something beyond what they're fixed into this little box, uh, which is really important. And so if you talk about the growth mindset and the fixed mindset, the fixed mindset is constantly looking for the yeah buts. Yeah, Enoch, but yeah, Scott, but you don't understand my industry. You don't understand my situation. You don't understand my employees. Guys, we've seen it all. I mean, we have seen it all. And so to have a fixed mindset is to look at your uh, inhibitions, to look at, at the things that are roadblocks that are ceilings for you and to accept that and to go, that's, hey, Enoch, that's my ceiling. I mean, do you honestly expect me to go past that ceiling? And Enoch, you're standing over there, yeah, but it's not. There's blue sky above that. And you see this lady and this guy and this guy, they're all experiencing that blue sky. The fixed mindset goes, yeah, I know they're experiencing, but they just live in a different place. The growth mindset hears that and go, oh, wow. Okay, well, tell me where I need to go. What do I need to do? And that's quite frankly what the AFF program is and why we built it the way it is because we want you to bust through the ceilings that you have. We want you to claw and fight and, and, and really work yourself out of this fixed mindset that you've got to say, hey, this is all I can do. 
You know, these are the only projects I can take. This is the only revenue I'll ever make. This is the only free time that I'll ever be afforded. And instead to go, no, 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 I want something different. And so I'm going to articulate that difference. And then I'm going to embed principles and, and lay strategy on top of that so that I can get uh, to whatever is beyond where I'm at today. Scott, you talked about, so, so far we've covered vision. You talked about the example from our coaching call that happened recently of taking unexpected fires, so to speak, and putting those at one time so they're expected and they're predictable. What is another, what, what would you say would be another one of your top tactical things that our listeners could implement tomorrow that you think would have a huge impact just on their daily life and on their business? Uh, team meetings, 100% team meetings. And again, we, we might cue the eye roll at this one, right? Because of, uh, I forget the name of the guy, the former CEO of Cameron. Cameron Harold. Yes, Cameron Harold, former CEO of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, wrote a great book called Meetings Suck. And that's what we think about meetings. We think they suck. And the reason we think they suck is because they're not predictable. They're not regular. They don't have agendas. We don't follow up on the agendas and they usually don't have a leader who's willing to risk uh, their own personal reputation to push the meeting forward. If a team doesn't have a meeting, it is no different than Ashley, my wife and I deciding not to communicate anymore as a husband and wife. If we just decide that we're not going to make an effort to communicate as a husband and wife, then you can probably write out the script of what's going to happen to us in the future. If you're not willing to communicate on a regular, consistent basis as a team within your firm, then Enoch and I can probably write out the script of what's going to happen in the future. And a lot of the thematic of that script is going to revolve around chaos. And so having an agenda, even just a simple agenda that you meet around for once a week, one hour, no technology in the room, unless you're taking notes on something, and you focus on that one thing and and an element of that agenda has a follow-up from last week and a prep for next week. As long as your agenda includes that, start meeting every week. And if you can do that simple thing, but we'll be amazed at how many people won't do it because it takes emotional labor to get that done. You know, I'm really interested to those of you, you're listening to this right now. First of all, thank you for your time, wherever you're listening to this in your car, at the gym, or maybe you're doing some drafting. Scott and I appreciate it. I'm curious to know what size firm you work in and whether you're currently doing team meetings and how you feel about those meetings. And a great place to leave that comment would be over at the, if you want to leave an iTunes review, that would be fantastic. You can just give whatever rating you want to the show and then just include in your comment what's happening. Are you having team meetings in your firm right now? Do you feel that they're effective? Are they working? Or you can send an email to enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. So Scott, just some follow-up questions on the meeting. For people who are already having meetings in their firm, what do they need to do? What are the one to two things that they need to do during that meeting to make sure that it's going to have that huge effect that you believe it will have on their business? Well, number one, it's got to be consistent. We've kind of got a rule that no, team meetings cannot be canceled. They can only be rescheduled. And so we recommend, again, a weekly team meeting. And you can reschedule that team meeting for that week, but you can't cancel it because we've got to create predictability. So in the agenda, there here's some things that you can talk about. And I'll just give you the outline uh, as an example. Number one, start with big wins. Always start with big wins because you set a tone of, of, of positive thoughts and comments when you start with big wins. These can be personal or professional. And when you do them and have fun with them, then you get to learn about the other team members in your team. I especially love the personal big wins. Those are a lot of fun. The second, and we're starting to encourage this a little more. Uh, This is just emerging, just new. uh, But we're actually uh, asking people to consider to share some of the biggest missteps over the last week. Because what we found, Patrick Lencioni's great book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, is that teams need to be building trust, but we have to work at building that trust. And one of the great ways to build trust is just to admit your failure, to come out during that team meeting and admit, boy, I really screwed this up this week, and, and, and receive grace from that. And so starting with a big win, starting with something that you maybe misstepped on this week. Then we go into accountability from last week. So you pull out a sheet of paper of where you wrote every, everything down or a spreadsheet or Trello or Basecamp or whatever you use for project management and you hold yourself accountable to last week's items. 
Because if you don't do that, what's the point of the team meeting and what's the point of accountability? Once that's done, then you talk about the business discussion that you need to talk about. If you're in a sales meeting, you talk about the sales numbers. If you're in production meeting, you talk about the production details. Once you're done with that, new action items are going to come back. So you're going to go back and add any new action items there. And then once you're finished with that, the final element of a great team meeting is to have about five minutes of simple team training. You're like, oh my gosh, I got to write a curriculum? No, no, no. Simple. Whatever a process is in your business, the drafting process, the construction documents process, the bid writing proposal process, whatever that process is, just document it, review it with the team, and then move on. And so you got big wins, missteps from the previous week, accountability from the week prior, business discussion, accountability elements for next week, and then five simple minutes of training about an existing process that exists in your business. Can you give me an example of a firm that has, I mean, you feel like this is a big game changer. You mentioned it as one of the top things that can give them, uh, some, some positive effects in their business. Give me a real world example of someone that you've worked with that's implemented this and the change that it had for the, the people in the firm in their lives and their personal lives. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me go back to the construction industry. I'll get out of architecture. I'll go back to another home builder uh, that did this and, and I'll kind of take you through the evolution of how this has worked and it's really extraordinary. So they fought, they didn't want to do it. They were like, yeah, we do, we do team meetings, we do team meetings, but they last for four hours and blah, blah, blah. And give me all the, the yeah, buts, right? They gave me all the excuses. And I asked him, I said, would you just be willing to try this, this strategy for three months, three months? And so they tried the strategy for three months. And so what they've done is they've now pared their meeting down to two hours a week. Uh, We usually recommend one, but there's a unique situation. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Two hours a week. And in those two hours a week, what they've done is the first hour and a half is the team meeting based on the agenda. The last 30 minutes, they invite a vendor to come in to bring lunch for their entire team and to have 30 minutes to do whatever they want to do. If they want to introduce new technology, new products, uh, new services, just build relationship, have lunch, whatever it is. So the team meeting is really about an hour and a half. And then they dovetailed uh, this vendor time on top of it. Now, what's ended up happening out of this is the, uh, the personal big wins from the team meeting have become so powerful that one of the team members just went through a horrific divorce in the last, uh, actually in the last 18 months. That's how bad it was, is it took uh, courts and juries and it was a mess. It was a total mess. But because this employee, this team member had the outlet of the team meeting, now the entire team is telling this employee and asking this employee every week, hey, how's it going? How's it going? They're encouraging them. They're praying for them. They're having them over for dinner to, to, to support and encourage their family. This employee has children that they're helping with and doing all these things. So this employee is now getting personal family support just because they had an outlet to be able to share some of these intentional family things that they were really struggling with. All that, that's not even uh, to include all the other elements that have come out in terms of team camaraderie and everything else that we could talk about. But that's one personal story of somebody who gained massive benefit all because the business owner had the courage to implement the weekly team meeting with an agenda. Awesome, Scott. So, is there anything we're, we're leaving out here that I haven't asked you that you feel like I should be asking you about helping architecture firm owners get back their freedom in their business? Enoch, when you think about all the elements that suck the time and the life out of a firm owner, employees, training, follow-up, customer interaction, uh, forecasting, budgeting, taxes, payables, receivable, I mean, we could go down the list. When you think about all that, Here's the one thing I want to encourage a firm owner. Don't worry about all that. The first thing that you can do is articulate a vision story. So if you can suspend the chaos in your mind for just a couple of hours to write down out of your head onto a sheet of paper where you see your firm going in the next 12 months or 18 months or 36 months and just do it to the best you can. Think about your finances. Where do you want your finances to be? Where do you want your product and service to be? Where do you want your own personal freedom to be? Where do you want your team to be? Who do you want your clients to be? And what do you want your culture to look like? If you can just write out in that simple framework of what you see in the future of your firm, suspend your thought about the payables, about the creditors, about the tax man, about the customer who's beating you down. Just suspend that for a minute. Draw out the vision for your firm. 
sit down for a quiet hour, draw that out. And one thing I will guarantee you is it will give you clarity. You may not like the clarity it gives you, but it will give you clarity. And from that clarity, you can begin to make decisions that are more strategic and principle-based about all the other elements as long as you've got that vision in place. And what happens if a firm owner writes down that vision and that piece of paper goes in a box somewhere in a drawer, never to be seen again? So then we hearken back to the proverb, where there is no vision, people scatter. So don't get frustrated when your team gets frustrated and you feel more chaotic if that vision goes into a binder, uh, because that's exactly what you're going to breed is chaos, scatteredness, frustration, dissension, gossip, all of those sorts of things, all because of a lack of vision. Scott, we know that there are a lot of uh, small architecture firm owners and specifically sole practitioners you know, here in the U.S. and both internationally, we have uh, firm owners who are from multiple countries who are in that program, you know, Croatia, South Africa, England, uh, you know, the U.K., United States. Question for you, you talked about team meetings as being a big hinge or a big lever. How does that apply to someone who doesn't have a team? Yeah, great question. So here's the uniqueness of a business owner is business owners always have a team, even if the team is just you. So if you're a solopreneur, a small business owner, and uh, you're running your firm, you're not only the CEO, you're also the vice president of sales, the vice president of marketing, the vice president of production, and the vice president of administration. And so the team meeting is just, if not more crucial for you as a solopreneur, to sit down in what we call the most schizophrenic team meeting uh, in all of small business. And that's with a team meeting with a solopreneur. You still need to have an hour a week where you, the owner, you, the the CEO, you, the vice president of sales, you, the VP of marketing, you, the VP of administration, sit down around your agenda and you talk through each one of those elements. Even if it's by yourself, nothing changes. Awesome. So what you're telling me, Scott, is that even if someone doesn't have any employees or any team members, they should still be having a weekly meeting. That's right. That's exactly right. And again, no excuses. Yeah, but, yeah, but, nope. Uh, The reality is, is you treat your business with one person, just like you treat your business with four or five people. All right. Awesome, Scott. So once again, that link, if you'd like to go get a deeper training on this, is www.businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. And I want to thank you, Scott, for being on the on this episode. I know in our next episode, we're going to dive more into a little bit about your backstory and some specific case studies of architects that have implemented specific principles, uh, including how they've been able to massively increase their profit and it really takes home huge amounts of profit at the end of the year by implementing some very basic principles. Yeah. Enoch, I I love what you have built and I am humbled and honored uh, that you would allow me to be a part of that. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Glad to have you on here, Scott. That is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. Get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard-earned profit. And they have pricing structures that work for the smallest of sole practitioners to the largest of firms. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.